Good evening. Welcome everyone to the tonight's 2022 Chair of Christian Thought Lebel Lecture in Christian Ethics. An evening with Father Cristino Bouvet. And thank you so much for attending and thank you for your patience is that we actually have sold out and we had a waiting list. And so we had to uh, process uh, um, people and uh, who are still coming in, but thank you for your patience. My name is Carolyn Music. I am the chair of Christian Thought at the University of Calgary in the Department of Classics and Religion. Uh, as we begin this evening, I gratefully acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Pikani, Ganai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Shiniki, Bearspaw, and Wellesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Metis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Uh, I would like also to thank my uh, co-host uh, this evening, which is uh, the University uh, is the Calgary Public Library that has welcomed us into this beautiful space of inclusivity and learning, and it's a real pleasure uh, to be here. And a huge thank you to Sean Lindsay, who is the coordinator at the Calgary Institute of the Humanities at the University of Calgary, who is recording tonight's event. Um, the Chair of Christian Thought Public Lecture Series occurs four times a year. This series facilitates an understanding of the place of religion in the past and present regarding ethics, education, spirituality, and urban concerns. And tonight is the Lebel Lecture in Christian Ethics. And somebody has asked me, what is the Lebel? What is that? And I'm going to tell you. So uh, before I introduce our speaker, I would like to say a few words about the namesake of this memorial lecture. J. Louis Labelle was born in 1918 and spent most of his life in Calgary. He belonged to the Roman Catholic faith and was a devoted community member, businessman, and scholar. A graduate of Laval, the University of Alberta, and the Harvard School of Business Administration, he worked for Chevron Standard and was elected vice president and director in 1957. Now, some of you uh, from the University of Calgary might recognize his name because from 1978 to 1982, he was chancellor of the University of Calgary. And uh, with Dr. PD, uh, uh, Dr. Peter uh, uh, Craigie, he started the fundraising initiative for the Chair of Christian Thought. So we have a lot to be thankful uh, to uh, Louis LaBelle. And he was a born leader. And he was remarkably active in many charities and uh, community and well being services. And I'll only just name three uh, the Calgary United Appeal, the Vanier Institute, and the Alberta Catholic Hospitals Foundation. And in 1985, he was recognized by the University of Calgary with an honorary doctorate. But let's turn to tonight's talk. And this evening, Father Christina Bouvet will be delivering the 2022 LaBelle Lecture in Christian Ethics. Father Christina will speak for about 50 minutes, 5-0, and then we will have about 30 minutes for questioning. Uh, Father Christina is a born and raised Albertan of mixed Cree, Métis, and Italian heritage. He was ordained in the Diocese of Calgary in 2012, and he currently serves as vicar for young adults. He oversees uh, this project based out of St. Mary's Cathedral mm -hmm. while providing pastoral care for students across the city, including the University of, Cal uh, University of Calgary campus. Mm -hmm. Father Cristino was the National Liturgical Coordinator of the Papal Visit to Canada this past July. And in many respects, uh, Father Cristino will be addressing that to some degree, but let me give you the, the exact name of the title of his talk is Becoming New Treaty People, Reflections Upon the Impact of the Ideological Colonization in the Ongoing Efforts of Promoting Indigenous Reconciliation in Canada. Please join me in welcoming Father Cristino Bouvet to the podium. It is a tremendous and humbling privilege to have the opportunity to address this fine group of people tonight. I recognize many faces in the crowd from among 
the young adults of the chaplaincy I serve, faculty of the University of Calgary, members of the faithful from throughout the Diocese of Calgary, and some of my beloved Indigenous brothers, sisters, and elders. Among them, most treasure to me of all, my aunt, Deborah Lloyd, who has traveled down from Merthorpe. You can see how very important she was uh, earlier this year. I'm honored by the presence of each of you, and I hope that we can explore together some topics of great importance to me, as challenging as some of them are to discuss. Despite this challenge, it is essential that we give voice to one another in mutual respect, which in turn makes it possible for authentic dialogue to occur. It is only from a position or place of listening, thinking, and freely responding that we all advance together, shoulder to shoulder, as members of the common human family, which we are. As has become clear, a large part of my public profile, if not the notoriety I experience these days, has first to do with my contributions to Canadian public life as a man of proud Indigenous heritage, while also being a grateful Catholic priest. This has been regarded as an anomaly, certainly not only in numerical terms, as there are admittedly few of us, but also due to the underlying supposition that there is a near to irreconcilable tension that I and my fellow Indigenous Catholic clergy must bear. I would like to state at the outset of this lecture that this so-called tension was not something I was ever mindful of until it was repeatedly noticed and marveled at by so many. I owe my original and ongoing sense of integration, which I have lived 10 blessed years as an Indigenous priest, to my beloved Kokum of happy memory, Amelia May Steinauer Bovet, who emboldened her grandson to embrace these identities and live them out freely and harmoniously. If there is anything I have accomplished or served this year, in particular and in all of the years of my priesthood towards Indigenous reconciliation. I have done so for her and by her indescribably powerful example in my life. I did not want to get too far into the weeds of my musings with you until I had first recognized Kokum. Two of her children spent most of their adult lives raising their families in Medicine Hat. My dad and one of his elder sisters, Auntie Debbie, whom I acknowledged here with us tonight. On the at least annual occasion that Kokum visited Medicine Hat, a small war would break out between Auntie's girls and my sister and I. In whose house was Kokum going to stay? And more importantly, while she was there, who got to donate their bed to her? You see, we observed that Kokum emanated a very particular scent, which we coined the smell of Kokum's hands. And God forbid if our mothers washed our beds after a visit from Kokum, before that scent had entirely dissipated. As a result, Kokum very patiently tolerated sleeping in four different beds on a visit of as many days. Wherever she went, a fragrance of sweetness and love would linger, which was the tangible experience of being in the presence of a truly great person. This is the Bible she gave me when I made my first Holy Communion in 1994. Although not a Catholic herself, she was very diligent about observing those important milestones in her Catholic grandchildren's lives. What I later came to love about this Bible was how there were already passages throughout it which she had highlighted in her own personal study. They revealed something about herself. One such passage was from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. 
Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I think that fragrant offering may have been the smell of my kokum's hands. I do not begin by this reflection on her life for the sake of sentimentality or nostalgia. In many respects, Kokum was the living embodiment of the themes I wish to reflect upon with you, at least as I experienced her and learned from her, many years seated at her feet. Carefully listen. I recently came across a description on the Government of Canada's website of our country's relationship to the British Crown as uniquely defining our constitutional monarchy. I quote, as the living embodiment of the crown, His Majesty unites Canadians, gives a collective sense of belonging to our country, and anchors our sense of national identity and pride. New Canadians swear allegiance to the King, so do members of Parliament and the legislatures, military and police officers. We do not swear allegiance to a piece of cloth, a document, or a political entity. Rather, we swear allegiance to a person who embodies all these. We often look to such living embodiments of our values and expectations in seeking to embody them ourselves. An interesting and perhaps shocking piece of trivia about Kokum was that she held in very high regard the sovereign and loved Queen Elizabeth II. I would attribute that at least in part to the fact that her eldest brother, the Honorable Ralph Garvin Steiner, was the 10th Lieutenant Governor of Alberta and thereby the representative of Her Majesty to our provincial legislature. Kokum therefore always spoke respectfully of our Queen and once reminded me not to forget that our treaties are with the Crown, not with the federal government. I believe, despite what little difference that practically and politically makes in our time, she recognized in an institution that was supposed to embody justice and fairness, a hope of guaranteeing the rights and freedoms our people are meant to enjoy. Not changing with the tides of political parties in our federal system of government. That is a way of thinking that came more naturally to someone from her generation. She was born in 1919. Then I believe we experience today. Perhaps some would call it naive, but I believe it summons us to reconsider where we are leading ourselves in the present tendency to dismiss and the fantasy of dismantling our institutions. Take, for example, a story recently reported by CBC News regarding three aspiring lawyers of Indigenous heritage in our province who have insisted that it is a racist imposition upon them to require that they swear an oath of allegiance to the sovereign, now King Charles III, before being called to the bar. It is alleged to be an assault against the cause of reconciliation to maintain this requirement of someone who claims to be triggered by being so required. I do not purport to determine what sorts of things one should or should not find triggering, but we objectively find ourselves at an impasse for reconciliation when one side of those to be reconciled with are regarded as triggering. It could be argued that it is, in fact, not the person, in this case, King Charles, who is himself triggering, but the institution he embodies and the obligation to swear allegiance to it. I accept that valid distinction. Nevertheless, it prompts me to ask, as the grandnephew of a lieutenant governor, who exclusively received all of his formal education 
in an Indian residential school, what sorts of things have transpired in these intervening decades where he could gratefully accept and discharge an office representing the crown with pride? Yet today, people of my same generation, not having been educated in the residential school system at all, are triggered by performing an act many degrees of separation removed from similarly acting in the name of the crown. Our current Inuit Governor General, Mary Simon, may well ask the same question. A reason for this dynamic, which I would like to advance this evening, is due to the longer period of time which has elapsed, free from this governmental construct of the Indian residential school system, wherein further reflection has awakened within people certain reactions which may formerly have seemed impossible or subconsciously stifled. The ultimate question I would like for us to confront is whether or not, in the absence of the IRSS, we are any further removed from the colonizing mentalities which gave birth to the institutions which actively robbed children of familial upbringing, language, and culture. I have been on the front lines of these considerations since last year, when I found myself beginning to wade into the conversations which arose from the reported discovery of a mass grave on the site of the former St. Joseph Residential School in Kamloops, British Columbia. That would later be quietly amended in media reportage from mass grave to unmarked burial sites. Modification also worth our consideration later. Nonetheless, from my first public comment in a sermon I preached on June 13th, 2021, to February 1st of this year, when I was asked by my bishop, still in secret, to begin serving the team preparing for the visit of Pope Francis to Canada in July, the acceleration of these events often left my mind spinning. Only now, several months after having formally served as the National Liturgical Coordinator for the Papal Visit to Canada on behalf of our country's Catholic bishops, have I found the time and ability to start piecing together my thoughts on all of this. I implore you each then to be merciful with me as I rather publicly begin working through many of my thoughts out loud. It will prove helpful to remind ourselves how we might characterize what the federally conceived and executed Indian residential school system was. Essentially, these institutions comprised a government program of forced or at least intensely coercive compliance, which fundamentally overrode individual and conscientious freedoms, whether of children or their parents, though claiming to be of the best of intentions for the greater good of both Indigenous students and the wider society. The leading educational and sociological experts of the day suggested this was the best conceivable campaign for dealing with the Indian problem. And without much hesitation, multi-denominational church leadership and many educators participated in the efforts towards unambiguous assimilation. The first terrestrial campaign of colonization having been basically completed, Indigenous peoples' land claims were frequently overshadowed or utterly disregarded by Confederation. There was another frontier yet to be conquered. Land itself, as sacred as it may be to a people, is not inherently necessary in carrying on who they are. In that sense, we are talking about culture. The élan vital of what makes them a people in the first place. And without question, a common language is the glue which holds that together. Therefore, the next campaign of colonizing these lands set its sights on eliminating the wide diversity of languages and cultures which were spread across 
these vast territories. Bear in mind, these languages and cultures were held by people who sometimes had nothing more in common with each other than that they were not Europeans. Even the proud and rapidly growing people known as the Métis were demonstrating a new way of being European in Canada. And apart from faith, little else resembled their non-Indigenous origins. The residential school campaign of assimilation then, properly speaking, could be identified under a name which I will borrow from the lexicon of Pope Francis. Since 2015, the Pope has made repeated reference to something he calls ideological colonization. On a return flight to Rome from the Philippines in January of that year, decrying what was then a tactic of wealthy nations in the West to hold hostage, as it were, financial aid to developing nations under the condition that they formally subscribe to certain Western values, particularly pertaining to sexual mores, Pope Francis stated the following. When conditions are imposed by imperial colonizers, they seek to make these peoples lose their own identity and make a uniformity in society. This is the globalization of the sphere. All the points are equidistant from the center. However, true globalization doesn't take the form of a sphere, creating uniformity and equal distances from the center. Rather, it is important that it is a polyhedron so that every people, every part, conserves its own identity without being ideologically colonized. If I might attempt to interpret where the Pope is taking this, he seems to be describing a secondary effort at further dominating people's lives, not merely by invading their land and pillaging their resources, but by forcing them to conform to a particular way of thinking and living. It should be clear how such was arguably the case with the residential school system. However, has that tendency come to an end? In the address he delivered at the Citadel in Quebec City this year, as a head of state visiting the representative of our head of state, Her Excellency Governor General Mary Simon, and in the presence of the Prime Minister and Diplomatic Corps, the Holy Father observed the following. In the past, the colonialist mentality disregarded the concrete life of people and imposed certain predetermined cultural models. Yet today too, there are any number of forms of ideological colonization that clash with the reality of life, stifle the natural attachment of peoples to their values and attempt to uproot their traditions, history and religious ties. This mentality, presumptuously thinking that the dark pages of history have been left behind, becomes open to the cancel culture that would judge the past purely on the basis of certain contemporary categories. The result is a cultural fashion that levels everything out, makes everything equal, proves intolerant of differences, and concentrates on the present moment, on the needs and rights of individuals, while frequently neglecting their duties with regard to the most weak and vulnerable of our brothers and sisters, the poor, migrants, the elderly, the sick, the unborn. They are the forgotten ones in affluent societies. They are the ones who amid general indifference are cast aside like dry leaves to be burned. Having addressed the secular authorities at the Citadel, the next evening in the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Quebec, addressing the bishops and clergy of the church in Canada, he carried on with this theme stating, let us not allow any ideology to alienate or mislead the customs and ways of life of our peoples as a means of subduing them or controlling them. The advances of humanity should be assimilated into their cultural identities with the keys of culture. I think he is on to something with the warning against the ongoing threat to our indigenous people of ideological colonization. 
Nothing makes threats more threatening, however, than being silent, hidden, ignored, or denied. If then we are going to address and subsequently destroy this threat, we must acknowledge where we are finding it. To that end, I would like and think it helpful to review what I wish to propose as three concrete examples where ideological colonization persists, even behind the guise of concern for or admiration of Indigenous people, but nevertheless imposing something that does not serve the cause of reconciliation. I believe I have witnessed these efforts in the three areas of the mainstream media, levels of government, and yes, still in the Catholic Church. Turning our attention first to the media, those invested with the opportunity to disseminate information, form opinions, and direct the course of broad societal activity wield an almost divine level of power. I would like to give those in positions of authority within the machine of the media the benefit of the doubt that they choose their words carefully and seek to portray things thoughtfully and accurately. When they do not, however, it can wreak immeasurable havoc. I alluded to this earlier with the fairly casual modification made to reporting on the alleged graves in Kamloops. However, I would like to turn my attention to something much more personal, which impacted me directly. Having been sought out by the CBC News to offer an editorial piece for a column called First Person, wherein I was invited to share a first-hand story about my relationship with my Kokum, you can imagine I was very honored. I submitted my first draft for editing, but was quite shocked when receiving it back in a Google Doc format for joint editing to see entire phrases added that I never wrote, one which used the word trauma as a way of describing what I had already described Kokum to have gone through, and the removal of the closing line of my piece, which was, this is true reconciliation. After some back and forth with the editors and my insistence that the closing line was required or I would withdraw my submission, I was told that it would have to be reviewed by one of their Indigenous consultants first. So I, as an Indigenous person myself, invited to share my first-person testimony in my own words, was now going to be double-checked for my indigeneity by an official Indigenous person. I suppose I may have overreacted in taking great offense at that, which I expressed to my main correspondent, and she very apologetically insisted that it would be fine as it was and thanked me for the submission. Indigenous people being told what to think and feel about themselves and their experience by non-Indigenous people who are eager to make some form of atonement is ideological colonization nonetheless. I regret to belabor the point, but I'm not sure when I will find myself with such a platform again. So permit me one more example. Coincidentally, again, with the CBC. Following the Papal Mass in Commonwealth Stadium in Edmonton, my father, whose health limitations made it impossible for him to be present, was terribly disheartened to hear the commentary being given within literal seconds of the Mass's conclusion. It was repeatedly summarized by several journalists and a brother priest, apparently also a fellow Indigenous member of the clergy, that the Mass was a missed opportunity. They proceeded to opine about the choices of music, the lack of Indigenous language, the vestments worn by the Pope, and the fact that Catholic liturgy, as is prescribed to be celebrated by all of our internal legislative texts, was somehow a throwback to the 1950s before the Second Vatican Council. 
What distressed me most about what they chose to focus their attention upon. While the aged and disabled Pope traveled halfway across the globe on day two of a cross-country pilgrimage, having first visited a powwow arbor on a reserve and a newly renovated Catholic church dedicated to the use of indigenous people, was that the celebration of our most sacred rites was regarded as merely a missed opportunity to speak to indigenous people. Meanwhile, their camera operators must not have been informed of the somber tone the commentators would be taking. While flashing between images of smiling, clapping, indigenously clad elders and former residential school students, some of whom I specifically arranged to ensure they had face-to-face -face contact with the Pope. Every point on which they leveled criticism against me directly as the person responsible for organizing all of the papal liturgies, a well-known fact they themselves had reported upon only days before the Pope's arrival, was explained in the 25 pages of media briefing notes I painstakingly burned the midnight oil to prepare amidst everything else I was organizing, precisely to avoid misrepresentation in the media. For people who insisted they hoped for nothing more than fostering reconciliation, they seemed instead to impose a narrated key for interpreting the events of the papal visit that worked toward the very opposite. It was more ideological colonization, not a missed opportunity. Secondly, I will turn my critical gaze towards structures of government to further illustrate this point. I begin by acknowledging that I'm about to trudge through a veritable minefield of emotions and opinions, which might seem like an unwarranted tangent from the topic of reconciliation. But again, I beg you to bear with me. Over the course of the pandemic, we evidently still continue to fight after nearly three years. Many complex decisions with unknowable outcomes had to be taken quickly and often without a complete picture of what would ensue. It is only fair to recognize that before proceeding with this example. However, the insistent manner in which vaccination against COVID-19 was enforced by governments, the utter refusal to admit of differing scientific opinions, and the routine name calling and imputation of motives on the part of elected officials against their own electorate has been a shocking experience for any society to endure. The wounds from which we will long be nursing. I bring this up because of a disturbing experience I had at the beginning of this year. While giving a talk to a diverse audience on the topic of the path forward with reconciliation in our country, I concluded upon my usual point of urging Indigenous peoples to see that the key to their own healing and peace lay within forgiveness. During the Q&A session, an Indigenous woman from the back row raised her hand and taking the mic, she proceeded to tell me, I feel very disconnected from you. I'm a Native person like you and a faithful Catholic like you, but I feel very disconnected from you. How can you tell me that my healing comes from forgiving the people who continue to abuse us just like they did in sending us to the residential schools? I had a knot in my stomach thinking of how to respond to her. So I decided to simply ask, how do you seem to see the same abuses continuing? She then said that she was a registered nurse, was proud of the schooling she had gone through to earn that job, 
and that she provided care to people on numerous reserves. She also had had COVID the month earlier, and though now fully recovered, she had just been put on leave without pay because of her refusal to take the vaccine. She was confident that she possessed natural immunity. She had reason to believe by what she was seeing going on around her that the vaccine did not effectively prevent transmission anyhow. And so she wanted to trust, as she said, the immune system the creator gave me instead of an experimental drug. I had begun that presentation by recounting, exactly as I did with you a brief while ago, my description of the residential school system as a government program of forced or at least intensely coercive compliance, which fundamentally overrode individual and conscientious freedoms, whether of children or their parents, though claiming to be of the best intentions for the greater good of both Indigenous students and the wider society. The leading educational and sociological experts of the day suggested this was the best conceivable campaign for dealing with the Indian problem. And without much hesitation, multi-denominational church leadership and many educators participated in the efforts of unambiguous assimilation. Now, replace the words Indian problem with COVID. And does it sound like a very different description than the vaccine mandates which cost her her job in healthcare? Again, please do not be lured down the COVID rabbit hole. We are all so tired of finding ourselves in by my choosing to use this example. I simply hope to make clear that despite our best intentions and with supposedly the best possible evidence, governments still have the capacity to behave in exactly the same manner now as they did when establishing the IRSS. Science-based decision-making can absolutely still be ideological. And in the case of my friend, could cost an accomplished Indigenous woman her employment. For my final example, I hope you can appreciate how uncomfortable and counterintuitive it is for me to even comment upon this. However, I feel it would be lacking in integrity to merely point out that I think the media and government are falling short of putting an end to colonizing activity and not comment upon my own beloved church and hierarchy therein. For all of Pope Francis's personal commentary and efforts to dismantle his own coined moniker of ideological colonization, I would hope that he might broaden his view to see a way in which he also continues to step into the self-laid trap. Admittedly, this example may seem not unlike the COVID vaccine example, unrelated to Indigenous reconciliation. But I think the blindness in this one may prove most troubling of all. The inability to recognize it risks the credibility of his otherwise very important efforts. And it has to do with what is mostly an internal point of division within the Catholic Church. And it is regarding an influx of people, predominantly the youth, towards the traditional form of liturgy, which preceded by centuries Vatican Council II. In a sweeping legislative move last summer, Pope Francis unilaterally, as is his right as Supreme Pontiff, abrogated the previously granted permission of his predecessor, Pope Benedict XVI, for priests to celebrate what has become known as the traditional Latin Mass. In an attempt to restore some of what only the passage of time could reveal had been lost by the liturgical reforms of the 1960s, Benedict perceived the simplest and most harmonious way back towards liturgical equilibrium was for priests, guided by clear principles he himself had laid out, to broaden Catholic lay people's access to the Old Mass. Though it was no secret that Pope Francis was not personally in favor of such sensibilities, it came like a bolt of lightning out of the blue 
when he all but forbade the ongoing use of that liturgy to the vast majority of the clergy and significantly curtailed the freedoms of the minuscule number left to offer it accordingly. It was a hard pill to swallow for many people who thought they were innocently going about their liturgical business rather quietly. This was all the more amplified when, having announced a synod to be held in the church, Francis invited the faithful to come forward in full force to express all of what they hoped to see different in the church in the future. He expressed that we needed to become a listening church where people would be heard. Yet to date, those who hold the opposite view of him as to what a wider diversity of liturgical expression in the church would facilitate, do not get the slightest hearing. Instead, the Pope has coined a nickname for them. He calls them backwardists. Those who want to restore a long gone time past and he will have none of it. Ironically, though, it is predominantly youth who knew nothing of that bygone time, seeking the restoration of these traditions. Not unlike our indigenous youth today, who, discovering that something of their heritage and patrimony has been kept from them in a systematic attempt to get them to move into a future without such things, earnestly seek to get it back. For that having happened to them, Pope Francis traveled all the way to Canada and apologized repeatedly. All the while continuing to do effectively the same thing to a not negligible number of his own flock within the church. A defect of human nature is not so easily seeing where we are guilty of the very things we hope we are tackling. I draw upon these three examples, therefore, to illustrate the still rocky road that lies ahead for reconciliation across these lands. Not because of a lack of desire or willingness on everyone's part to have it, but for the blindness which obscures the way in which our behaviors continue to facilitate the same problem we think we are overcoming. The bottom line is this. Indigenous peoples remain at risk of being further colonized, not necessarily over their land, but for their minds. When they come up against popular opinions or interpret their lives in ways alternative to a culturally, governmentally imposed narrative propped up by the church. And it is not just Indigenous peoples facing this threat. It is everyone. And it is harming the process of healthy human progress, particularly when people are generically labeled as oppressors and victims. Consider the Indigenous peoples who live in fear, not of being racially discriminated against by someone in the general public, but by their own people, there are some who prefer not to see themselves primarily or at all through the lens of victimization. They want to experience the freedom that comes from saying, I have persevered through my adversities and I have prevailed. I am not a victim. I am not a survivor. I am me. Yet to such people, especially those who live on reserve, or in indigenous communities, they may routinely be called colonized Indians because they are allegedly letting themselves be ruled by colonizing mentalities, as if embracing an identity of abuse hard done by victims was somehow an enviable identity. At a moment in history when the Marxist ideals of deconstructing the structures of society, particularly Western civilization, are so glaringly prevalent, this objective is always only accomplished by guilt-laden, self-identifying, privileged oppressors joining the side of whomever are 
the oppressed victims. And immediately, this casts the social order into a dichotomy, generating a beleaguered, oppressed people who are no further helped anyway. Look at so many contemporary Indigenous people, especially on reserve, or the impoverished living in urbanized centers. Being identified as victims of anything or everything gets them still no further ahead. Most infuriatingly, though, the other side of the dichotomy leaves the remaining privileged people who need not change anything about themselves so long as they identify as repentant oppressors. Citing what I consider to be the irresponsible category Pope Francis casually used on his flight back to Rome from Canada, that what happened in the IRSS was a genocide our parliament has recently advanced a motion formally recognizing what took place in the schools as genocide. What are we to make of such a declaration? Especially in the face of those evidently guilty of stealing land they do not intend to return every time we make land acknowledgments which refer to unceded territory or those now apparently guilty of the high crime of genocide, but who go unpunished. Our former Prime Minister, Jean Chrétien, was the Federal Minister of Indian Affairs who oversaw the transformation of the school system and defended it in the 1960s, despite being repeatedly made aware of the abuses. And now, he is implicitly guilty of participating in a genocide, apparently. But he sat undisturbed through the mass celebrated by Pope Francis and Saint Anne de Beaupre. Are there to be no personal consequences by making such a declaration? If not, what was the point of the declaration? Or was it to establish a clearly drawn line by which those who jump to the correct side of it take personal responsibility and have nothing further to do than that. This then leaves behind a third group, the unrepentant oppressors, who as privileged people are supposedly not victims of anything and therefore have never been oppressed except their refusal to take part in the dichotomy causes them to be styled as the enemies of everyone, and thereby the only people responsible for the ongoing oppression of the oppressed. Does this get us anywhere? Do these never-ending diatribes about the privileged and victimized, the oppressor and oppressed, get those who are struggling most any further ahead? I think not. What is needed is not activism, but the time-honored principles contained within the social doctrine of the Catholic Church. Sadly, I suspect out of fear of being regarded as unrepentant oppressors, the church's hierarchy sometimes allows itself to be accused of and blamed for things unjustly, supposing that they are taking the high road, but inadvertently and implicitly end up disadvantaging the indigenous people they sincerely seek to uplift and serve by failing to boldly continue offering the only meaningful thing we as a church have to offer, not money, verbal apologies, or more tokenism, but her teachings. Many have often remarked that in Canada, we are all treaty people. With the help of the Catholic Church and her inspired principles, I am confident that we can all become part of a new treaty people. 
The church lends her most important and credible help in achieving this aim through the body of teachings which formulates the basis of what we refer to as our social doctrine. Here I am referring specifically to the themes of solidarity and subsidiarity. As valuable as anything else, the hierarchy of the church initiates and invites all of the clergy and faithful of the church to live out in advancing our efforts at reconciliation between all peoples, whether that be through fundraising, activism, or any future formulations of words of apology, nothing will be as valuable as promoting solidarity with and subsidiarity for Indigenous people. By solidarity, we are referring to the gospel value of seeing Christ in all others. We do not profess to only encounter our Lord in worship or attendance at Sunday Mass. We ought to be encountering him in every person we meet. This translates practically into seeing the burdens and stresses of others as my own. Last weekend, a clearly intoxicated Indigenous man vocally and belligerently entered our cathedral in the middle of our service, causing vulgar interruptions. Rather than regarding him as an enemy, disrupting the worship of God, I was so proud of the young men in my community who approached him with patience, respectfully led him out just to listen to him and hope to help him calm down, and then lovingly lead him right back to the front pew of the church to quietly participate in the remainder of Mass. He was not an enemy. He was our brother. That is solidarity. Subsidiarity reminds us that people ought to be left to freely determine their own solutions to their own unique needs without the interference of a higher authority, without abandoning people who are lost and desiring support that is safeguarded by solidarity. We also respect their inherent dignity by refusing to meddle in their affairs, especially by not imposing our preconceived notions upon their situation. This is the antidote to ideological colonization. Before regarding indigenous people first or exclusively as victims of horrendous crimes who require my participation in their justice, we must look beneath the overarching umbrella, which the very term Indigenous Peoples covers, and see, rather, individual people who may not so neatly fit within our descriptions, nor therefore our conclusions. The gravest injustice our first peoples faced in these lands was to be regarded as less than others. Canadians have come no further ahead if our people are still seen the same, but now with a note of sorrow or pity. You have listened at great length, and perhaps for some in great discomfort. And for that, I sincerely thank you and respect your openness. I will leave you then considering the theme with which I began, the embodiment of of the values we claim to espouse. To help me do so, allow me to propose to you two indigenous people whose embodiment can serve as an example to us all. First, an indigenous Mexican, rather than a Canadian. Kuahaut Latoatzin was a Chichimec peasant in the 16th century, who after converting to Catholicism, while still a minority among his people, became known as Juan Diego. He famously received an apparition of the Virgin Mary, whom we now refer to as Our Lady of Guadalupe, a depiction of whom you see on my t-shirt. 
Today is the feast day in the Catholic Church on which we honor this man, whom we now call a saint, for the example he showed in faithfully serving his peoples while faithfully spreading awareness of and devotion to the Virgin Mary, who in her apparition to him did not come in the form of a European statue, nor the Jewish peasant which she historically was. She appeared as a mestiza, virginal princess, a sign of her closeness to the people she sought to call her own children. It is my sincere hope that the shared example of them both may enlighten a path of solidarity and subsidiarity in our lands too. Finally, I recall with you one last time, my beloved Coco. Specifically with regard to an important part of her practically lifelong work. Throughout most of the 70s and 80s, she served as the executive director of the Rocky Mountain House Friendship Center, remaining a member of their board and a trusted elder until her death in 2019. From their national website, friendship centers describe themselves as places which continue to provide culturally based programs and services that respond to the distinct needs of urban Indigenous people. They are known for their ability to bridge gaps that exist between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in urban areas. Nothing about the name makes specific reference to race or culture, but rather a human phenomenon, which cuts across all lines of distinction within the human family that of friendship. At the time of my Kokum's passing, more people than I could possibly remember approached me after her memorial service to let me know that May was such a dear friend. Among them were old and young, indigenous and non-indigenous, longtime farmers, and even recently arrived immigrants. Christians and non-Christians, men and women. Friendship is the pattern of what reconciliation will look like in the future. Of far greater importance than anything we will accomplish through activism, re-education, funding, or programs. And the night before he suffered and died for us, as Christians, we recall among Jesus' final words, I call you now my friends. I hope I can say the same of each of you and you of me. As we overcome all of our colonizing tendencies, may we fill that void with the handshake of friendship. Merci. Maybe it would be best in the interest of time to uh, just feel free to open the floor, but you'll have to speak uh, loudly or else we'll pass the microphone back and forth. But I am very happy to take any of your questions or uh, if there's anything you'd like to comment upon in particular. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for this beautiful speech. It was truly inspiring. Uh, I have a question for you. You mentioned a few institutions which have taken steps in um, address, addressing things differently, attempting. Um, you didn't mention, and you're probably aware that the private sector also has made tremendous efforts to support the government after this IRSS um, uproar that we had possibly, was it 2021? Right, okay. Uh, I work for a big financial institution and um, it was part of the mandatory learning we have to do once in a while to take um, a course. It was about two hours. Uh, it was pretty technical, you know, uh, and it was the purpose of it was to, hmm, to teach everyone about the history of our relationship with the indigenous community and to spread awareness and to also support government in their efforts. 
So then I started thinking about it. I'm Romanian. I moved here in 1999. I have zero tensions in my DNA. I don't understand any of this, <laughs> right? Because I'm new in this conflict. I, I didn't understand it. But one thing I noticed after this happened in our um, client forms, there was a button which asked indigenous or not. What do you think of that? It, does that help or does it go against what we're trying to do here? Do you, you don't even have to answer, just maybe something to think about. And Thank you. No, I, sorry, I don't know. Is that good? Okay. I thank you for that question. Uh, I'm not, I don't know what to say about what motivates uh, a private sector institution to indicate or ask people to indicate something like that. So that keeps going on and off. I personally, I don't know that it's necessary to give people the, or to suggest that there is anything to be gained from indicating that specific part of your identification, uh, as opposed to whatever else it might be. Now, I, I hope I have not communicated to you my sense that there should not be education. There absolutely should be education. I am a great admirer of, I can't remember if it was Murray Sinclair, but someone, someone involved in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission famously said, education got us into this mess and education will get us out of it. I absolutely think we need to be educated. My only concern is that restricting our education to learning about historical atrocities does not help us advance and it does not lift victims out of victimization. It makes people feel better about themselves that they've given the time of day to hear about it. We should be being educated about the richness of the people who remain in our midst that have something profoundly beautiful to offer us, especially as those who have passed the course of human history surviving in this land. We have something to learn from how they live, not how they were oppressed. And so we have to be careful that we don't reduce education about indigenous people in this country to only just what they've gone through, but to see how we can continue to learn because we understand their future, their culture better. That has a more promising future because it facilitates making it easier to become friends. I am watch, I saw this happen throughout the papal visit. The vast majority of Canadians did not come to participate in any of it. And they said, oh, that's, that's not for us. That's for the Indigenous people. We cannot have this us, them. That is not friendship. That is not reconciliation. We should have jumped at the opportunity to better understand and, as the motto of our visit said, walk together. And so when we make people nervous and uncomfortable about talking to or about Indigenous people or about their historical sufferings, no one is being helped. And we just remain in our silos. Sam, can you speak loudly? Yeah. Uh, speaking on the topic of education, teachers are required to incorporate Indigenous culture into these ways of knowing in their lessons. Um, that's now kind of become a big part of furthering truth and reconciliation. So how would you like to see I thank you for asking that because as you can imagine it has come frequently to me now to comment upon that and I think basically the thing I always hear about is how can I talk about the residential school system in a way that the children can handle and my first question is why do you have to talk about the residential school system do you know my aunt Deb that's a, now sadly she uh, deserves retirement she retired but I grew up with her in Medicine Hat, traveling around to all of our schools, offering us cultural education. We learned about Indigenous people. We learned about how they lived. We learned about what we still benefit from because of how they lived. That is helpful. That is useful. That is a way forward with reconciliation. But when people think that to talk about reconciliation means honestly confront what happened in the residential schools, of course, that is a part, but I believe that it is a small part of the much bigger picture of what needs to be presented so as not to create an ongoing marginalization of, a, for example, an Indigenous student who might be in your class. I know everyone kind of looks at out of the side of their eye feeling nervous because they don't know how to handle that person. 
that is not helping them. And so we need to make sure that we have, I, I don't even want to say a balanced approach, but that we don't give our students a solitary diet of historically rehashing the atrocities of the past. Sure, you can use the microphone but to talk quietly. So can, can you can you talk to the thought process of fixing? Because whenever we 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 say, hey, something's wrong, you're 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 articulating friendship and moving forward together. I hear constantly go back and fix it. And I hear it from all sorts of different sides. How do you how do you address that? We're not here to fix. How do we move forward together? Thank you. The bottom line is you don't fix the past, right? That's, I, everyone knows I always talk about the Lion King. And Rafiki tries to swat Simba once and he hits him on the head. And he says, what'd you do that for? He says, why does it matter? It's in the past. But then when he tries to swat him again, Simba ducks. He says, ah, see, you learned. So we can't go back and change what happened. It is helpful to make sure that we don't whitewash over it as though nothing happened. Well, I feel quite comfortable saying, I don't think we're doing that. I don't think we've been doing that for a, a, a good long while now, but we cannot accept the accusation or be burdened with the guilt that wanting to move forward together in friendship is somehow ignoring the past. It is having learned our lesson and realizing what happens when we disturb that friendship. And this is something that I harped on continuously. They were sick and tired of hearing me talk about this and all the papal visit planning. I kept talking about our history together with indigenous peoples as a church in this country did not begin with the residential school system. We had 200 years of harmonious relations before we naively stepped into that construct. So we cannot just look back only so far. We have to take the whole and see where has what worked been abandoned and where has what failed instructed how we move forward. And I think then we don't need to talk about fixing anything unless it's to talk about repairing broken relationships. And unfortunately, those are what endured throughout our society right now in many ways, not just between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And so that's where we really need to focus some attention. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Calgary. My name is Joy Palacios, and um, it's lovely to meet you. And I have a question about another institution I care a lot about, which is the university, the academy, and I'm wondering, um, how do you think scholars can participate in in friendship? Um, scholarship is sort of a funny thing, right? You study something, and that involves, in some degree, not always putting it arm length, but you know, you, you have to think about it. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, sometimes you love the things you study, right? Um, and for scholars who uh, study the past, I study the 17th century France. And some of the priests I studied, then they came and they helped found Montreal. And if I were going to follow them to Montreal, I would need to think about how they were related to indigenous people there, but I myself am not indigenous. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how scholars can participate and especially scholars who might not be indigenous themselves, um, but do um, want to study the past? How can they, how can they do that well? Thank you. I really appreciate that question. And I have to say that since stepping into the role I have now as a university chaplain for a bulk of my time, I, I'm very inspired by being at the universities. And I love being in an institution where the ideal of learning and study is what everyone is there for. Uh, as I was saying, we I think can characterize the great drama of what we're going through between this us them mentality, the, the grave danger that exists in making the other simply other and not a potential friend, not a partner, not a collaborator, 
And so where I think scholars and those in the academy will have a very important role to play is to set a very robust example of putting aside that us them mentality. And that comes, I think, naturally. When you become an expert in something, you, you have amassed uh, an awareness or a, a depth of knowledge about a very particular topic that I think inadvertently can cause you to become quite far removed from anyone else who is not as well versed in that. And so I think as the one who has inadvertently drifted away, the scholar has a special responsibility to say, how can I not use my knowledge in an us them mentality or where I am in some level of superiority because I understand things you don't understand, but instead from a posture of humility and gratitude for that depth of understanding can then respectfully go to the other, not in a condescending manner, but in that gesture of friendship, in that openness to share. And so I think modeling that first of all for your students uh, is so important. I, I have had the very pleasant experience of interacting with numerous professors, especially at the University of Calgary, who are so easy to approach, who are so thoughtful, who take interest in you. I feel like, well, I don't know what I have anything to say to this very educated and intelligent person, but that's not, that's not how this uh, transaction needs to go, that we can receive from each other. And so demonstrating that among your colleagues, with your students, and setting that as the example of academic excellence, being capable of compellingly communicating this knowledge you do have because of your friendship, I think is one of the greatest gifts that you're going to be able to offer. Auntie Debbie. I'm here to correct my nephew. <laughs> As usual. No, I'm, I'm Auntie Debbie. Um, throughout the papal visits, everyone, including the Holy Father, referred to me as Auntie Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was very proud to be one of the lead Indigenous consultants for the country of Canada on the uh, papal visit. And uh, strangely enough, um, when Father Christina was brought to the table, he... Uh, said to the people at the table, I would like to bring Auntie Debbie on. And they kind of looked at him with a jaundiced eye <laughs> and thought, and I, this was reported to me, that Auntie Debbie, is this some teetotaling little old granny that we're going to have to handhold? Um, but they didn't know that I had developed as a, this young man back here was asking about uh, teachers and what teachers are supposed to teach. I helped the Alberta Teachers Association develop all of the programs and workshops. I was one of the key writers on most of those workshops and how we move forward with Indigenous education in the school systems today. I have um, spent a lot of time talking to academics about how do we do this. By doing what you're doing right now, by selling out these kinds of events, by listening to my learned nephew, by listening to elders within your community, by, by showing that you're unknowing, keeping it humble. And I think one of the most important themes that I ever helped move forward within the Alberta Teachers Association and teaching teachers how to teach Indigenous content was that when we arrive at the place where we are talking about this to our children and our grandmothers who are non-Indigenous at the supper table and imparting what Father Cristino shared with you tonight at the supper table and bringing a new level of, aware of awareness to your group of people. When you're in the faculty lounge talking about, hey, did you know? That's where the academics come in. 
that's where you're going to have the biggest impact on your fellows. That's where you're going to be assisting in that friendship process. So you have a huge responsibility now that you've been here and listened to this. God doesn't speak to us willy-nilly. Once you know something and creator has imparted that knowledge upon you, you now have a responsibility to share it. And that's how we're going to move forward. And that's how reconciliation is going to work. And that's why I'm so ever, ever, ever so proud of my nephew and the work that he does because he followed Auntie Debbie everywhere she went. He worked, if you want to Google things like history in the hills and and uh, he worked setting up teepees and and making bannock and sharing the fry bread with 500 kids a day, you know, those are the things, those were the things that taught him. So he has that, he has that practical experience. And so when the Holy Father was coming, I just was so thrilled that this young man was able to work on that, that initiative. So uh, questions? He can answer them. Hi, hi. Father Cristino, and um, the, so the question is to Father Cristino, and it will include Auntie Debbie as well. Um, and it's um, how have you brought this teaching in recent times to the program for seminarians? Thank you. For those who just may not be familiar with the term that was used, seminarians refer to uh, those young men who are training uh, for the priesthood in the Catholic Church. They are students of a seminary, so we just call them seminarians. And I also have a role in, in my capacity known as the vocation director. So I oversee the uh, preparation of and ongoing accompaniment of those who are training to be ordained for priests, specifically to serve within the Diocese of Calgary. And so uh, I'm very grateful that you thought to, to even ask that because I have also wondered in what way are our seminarians learning anything about this? And that is when it really came to light for me when I was a seminary student. I was two years in the seminary and having completed a course in the history of the church in Canada, that it finally dawned on me that after knowing my Pokem had spent 12 years in the residential school, that maybe she was not all that comfortable with her grandson becoming a priest. I, it hadn't occurred to me because she had never given the slightest indication of that before. And so it was only there and then learning about that history that I was confronted by this possibility and so asked her about that. And she, of course, was extremely supportive and encouraging of my vocation because she said, I've known good priests and nuns, and I know you'll be one of those. But now I think that there is a responsibility to make sure that seminarians don't just learn about this history and then say, yes, I'm aware of it. Sorry, it happened. And I won't participate in a residential school. That's not what's at risk here. The question that they need to ask is, what does pastoral ministry with Indigenous people look like? Because in all likelihood, serving in, a, in the Diocese of Calgary, as an example, taking in all of Southern Alberta, you are unlikely to end up in a parish where you are not going to have a, a, at least some component of your congregation be from some other Indigenous community than necessarily Calgary or wherever it is that you're working. And so to realize that that is a reality that has a special sensitivity because of this history and this complex reality that we have, it is unlike certain other ways of doing your ministry among other groups of people that you could classify as groups. So I've actually begun working with our local seminary in Edmonton. And just this year, uh, we had our first session of what I've been told will become 
uh, an annual and ongoing workshop that they've asked me to deliver for now, and we'll continue to develop building something out on pastoral ministry with Indigenous peoples. And so that we're having actual concrete objectives at what it looks like to work with and among Indigenous people, and not just evaluating the history, as I've said, can be problematic. Well, um, unfortunately, we are out of time. And I just want to thank again, Father Cristino, for sharing um, a very constructive and positive plan and way forward. And as you say, walking together, it's been very I, I, humbling. And I think this is uh, the way the way we can talk about it, our, the scholarship and the uh, education and the personal relationships is by is by having this kind of discussion. And it's really important that you took the time to explain to us the very difficult issues, you know, the media, um, the, the government, the church, and not just attacking them. You didn't attack them, but you presented ways of how we can approach the issues and the questions and the problems. So thank you very much for that. And thank you for coming and for your attention. Uh, please join me in thanking once again, Father Christina.